so first, I would love to express a heartfelt thanks to um, Kurt Witcher of the Genealogy Center at ACPL for inviting me to speak with you all today. At the Indiana Historical Society, we collect and preserve Indiana's unique stories. We bring Hoosiers together in remembering and sharing the past and inspire a future grounded in our state's uniting values and principles. Storytelling really matters to us. And while we share this method with you today, it was inspired by how we approach our collections and share with our audiences through our immersion-based exhibits that transport you back in time. Two years ago, I picked up the Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane for the very first time. Crane, a journalist turned novelist, is a master at placing the reader in the moment, experiencing everything he describes. His detail of the main character's actions and thoughts during the Civil War was so descriptive and captivating, I falsely assumed Crane had served in the war himself. Crane simply did the work we're about to do today, to research the history and experience of a time and place, to fully engulf one's research into the senses that we could reasonably presume the thoughts of someone and create a story we hope they're still talking about 125 years later. To me, this is what family history storytelling should be all about. Whether it's a mundane daily experience or something so terrible or terrific, we never forget the details and lessons we learn from that story. As the family historian for my family who learned from those before me, it's never about creating massive trees, it's, ne it's never about tracing lines hundreds and hundreds of years back, but about the stories shared around the table and what they mean to us. It's reading a letter ab about my seven times great grandfather describing the fear, uncertainty and hopelessness of losing his wife during the 1793 yellow fever epidemic of Philadelphia and applying that to how I'm experiencing the coronavirus pandemic today. It's about animated dialogue on the viewpoints of the many different faiths we find in our family or the varying stances on educational philosophy. It's about my mom and I exploring her dad's time in the Navy in World War II that he never spoke about. It's about piecing together his service record, talking to veterans who served on his same vessel, watching documentaries and movies, reading books and listening to oral histories so that maybe my family will understand with much more clarity and empathy exactly why he never shared that he was at D-Day, that he was at the invasion of Okinawa, and that he was at the invasion of Southern France. I'm excited about sharing N4G with you so that you can take what you learned here and apply it to any story you found in your family history so that you can build out your research with all the details you need to create your own Crane-style story for the generations. But mostly so that together, we can be more critical thinkers of the stories we search for and build empathy back into how we explore the past and how that impacts our understanding today. That we can fill out experiences where records might be lacking, that we can apply a whole life to a person that was a hash mark on a record, and add experiences, humanity, feelings, and desires to those ancestors once considered property. That we recognize it is a privilege to be able to find our story in these records and understand whose stories are missing. Let's get started. I'd like to start this session out with some goals of what we'll be learning together today. We encourage fact-based or fact first and immersion-based research second. This method of research is not to replace the genealogical per standard, but to build on it. Inspire a style of researching that supports and enhances storytelling. I see a lot of genealogists avoid writing histories that are deeper than base facts on their individual ancestor. Maybe we don't know what details to expound upon that could help us be better storytellers or we don't think that there's enough information to inform a better story. This is where the tools with this new method can be super helpful. Together, we'll learn to look at the past from a different perspective, to ask questions of our resources, and to be more creative with where we find additional information. We'll learn a new way of thinking about our ancestors and their experiences, 
and a new way to approach researching those experiences. This is a new style of workshop that you might not be used to. Traditionally, this has been taught in a highly participatory manner with groups of people around the table with giant post-it notes and markers. It's loud, and while I guide the workshop, we're all learning from each other. More recently, this has moved to a Zoom meeting where everyone's video was on and we're all able to chime in and um, share with each other. In this way, we call this workshop a brains on workshop, where we walk away with new tools on how to look, how to look, not where to look. This brains on session is a perfect stepping stone before diving into a writing project or breaking into a complex brick wall. Regardless of where you are in your research or who is in your research, this method will bring a breath of fresh air. Genealogy is the science of studying family history. Like scientists, we search for all the data. When the data has contradictory or unclear results to the larger work, we dive deeper, we look harder, we exhaust all the resources we know of. We work to prove theories or solve barriers. We attend courses to sharpen our knowledge and learn new technologies to advance our work. We reach out to experts in their field for advice. We hire experts on contracts. And then we write summaries and abstracts from all the data that we can possibly find to draw conclusions as to what likely occurred. This scientific method of approaching the social science of family history is more commonly known as the genealogical proof standard. This is the building block of sound genealogical research. But what this method in 4D proposes is to build on this. When we have exhausted those genealogical resources, we jump to a different dimension of research. When the genealogical proof standard does not paint enough of the picture, we need to move to the art. When resources are thin, we can still build an entire world for ourselves. When building an immersive museum exhibit like the Indiana Historical Society is known for, we move beyond the foundational research. Oftentimes, we're met with very little imagery to create a space for our guests to step back in time to an 1839 inn in the western wilds of Indiana, or step into Madam C.J. Walker's office for, from her factory here in Indianapolis. But we research what other inns at the time were like. We study photographs, we talk to people, we study the religion, philosophy, and accents of those who are likely there, and we fill the space with what we know and what we can guess from our historical hypotheses. So as we dive into this style of research, it's important to remember that at no point are we asking you to falsify. This is finding resources related to specific moments in time that will help you tell a deeper story of your family's past, one that is more truthful in its complexities, its senses, and emotions. I will give you some examples but it can be done with absolutely any topic. We should all come away with great ideas to apply this to our own stories or to help others connect to their past in more meaningful and complete ways. So if you've had the opportunity to hear the wonderful and fabulous Kurt Witcher speak over the past few years, you've probably heard him talk about the power of story once or twice. Everyone can relate to a story. They help us organize our life experiences and connect them into a meaningful whole. When we share our story, what we share is about our history. It connects us to our past while also giving us the wisdom we need to guide our future. Ultimately, we want to pass on historical knowledge to the next generation, and one of the best ways to do that is with great storytelling. As I've said earlier, the essence of M4D is to provide an achievable stepping stone between gathering standard genealogical data and then sharing, writing, telling, or performing captivating stories, ultimately to be a better storyteller. When we think back to the times we heard great and powerful stories that stuck with us for years, it often has to do with how connected we found ourselves to the subject of the story. Maybe it taught a lesson or had an incredibly relatable character we carry with us for so many years. It mattered to us then and it matters to us now. It spoke to us on a deeper level. Without consciously thinking about how we explore these stories and tell these stories, we lose key opportunities for meaningful connections. 
We can consciously switch to thinking about the past in a way that we experience events around us today. While we might not have a surviving journal that tells us everything a person did or felt, we do all have our senses in common. And what we sense certainly feeds into how we feel. And when we experience great stories, we feel something. If we can connect the two, we have hit something powerful, right? In museums, this is where we look to, where we study and interpret the past to inform the future. As family historians, we can and should do the same in a way that honors our family in a much more meaningful space. N4D is a method of helping us research in greater detail, guided by the five senses, sight, smell, taste, touch, touch, and hearing. When we apply asking something so simple and common as the five senses, it provides that stepping stone to be better storytellers. Expanding your understanding of social history with N4D helps us to build detailed pack story from facts and build story in places where you can't find the facts. It is an experience-based view of history from the bottom up, from tiny details rather than only major events in time or within a person's life. It's also a way to research experiences of persons not easily found in records. This dimension into the past will enhance your understanding of how people lived, worked, and played, adding new depth to how to view their lives. Why is sensory-based exploration important to telling the stories of our ancestors? It adds the familiarity of how, of now to then. It adds the pieces of humanity back in from cold facts on vital records. It explores more about individuality in a singular time and moment. It can build with us an understanding of pain, fear, joy, hope, everything. It adds us, it aids us in understanding who a person really is and not just that we know they existed in a moment. It takes us from knowing they lived through an event to feeling it with them. How do we write experiences when we are challenged or by limited records or resources? We create. We aren't making things up. We're taking our traditional records and social history and applying them to common experiences. I know people need to eat and like to do things for fun. That's a thing we all share in common. I know that my great grandma went to a friend's 16th birthday party because I found a newspaper article that told me so. One year later, I read about another teenage birthday gathering, but she wasn't listed on the guest list. What it did tell me was the entire menu and the activities they played. Some of the friends from the first birthday party are listed, so I can reasonably guess that the types of food and activities listed were things we sh that she would have eaten and participated in in her life, right? Yes, I can reasonably guess that, and I will include that in her story. This is what we mean by researching a common experience in a broader scope to apply to the person and moment you'd like to explore further. We're not making anything up. We're broadening what could have happened or likely did happen. In the case of my pappy, there's no surviving letters, interviews, or stories from him, but I can explore in so many directions to help inform what his naval experience in the war was like. And not every way I can do that is a traditional record or resource. So today we challenge you to flex your research comfort zone and begin to ask questions based on shared experiences to explore a micro history of a person whose story could so easily be lost to time. So let's play with perspective for a minute, which is my favorite thing to do because I create miniatures as a hobby. Microhistory is a genre of history writing that focuses on small units of research, such as an event, community, individual, or settlement. Basically, this is another term for what most of us already do. It's most distinctive because it, because it is the small scale of the initial individual focus into a larger lived experience of a society or event. In the case of my pappy, he was one person of over 100 on his LST 504 in the Navy in World War II. He was one person in the US Navy, one person serving in the war, and one person experiencing this horrific global event. 
by studying him, I am taking a micro historical approach to the larger experiences of his LSP, the Navy, and how the entire world experienced the events surrounding World War II. I have room to expand or narrow his experience to those larger perspectives. While the idea of microhistory became more popular in the 1970s, he first catched the term in 1959 when historian George R. Stewart published Pickett's Charge, a microhistory of the final attack on Gettysburg, July 3rd, 1863. This book is a 310 page book on just 15 hours. 310 pages on 15 hours. Can anyone think of a similar chunk of time in your own life that you could devote that much space to describe? What about with a family story you've come across? That's the work we'll explore. Stewart chose this particular moment of the Civil War as a poignant and important piece to explore in detail that not only walked through the military movements of the day, but also of the adventures of individuals and their thoughts and feelings. And this last bit about thoughts and feelings was huge and sounds familiar to what Crane was accomplishing with the Red Badge of Courage. I'm going to read this opening paragraph of Pickett's Charge, a microhistory of the final attack on Gettysburg July 3rd, 1863, out loud. So close your eyes and really drop into this paragraph as I read it. Really try to sense what I'm describing. Think about what smells or sights come to mind when you hear this opening to a story. Pickett's Charge, a microhistory of the final attack on Gettysburg, July 3rd, 1863. On the battlefield, in their tens of thousands, the men slept or lay resting. The night was mild, forecasting a warm day to come. The moon, a little past full, illuminated the shot-torn fields and pastures with a dim and silvery splendor. So quiet it was that an officer of the 19th Massachusetts, wakeful near a clump of small oaks and a good mile from town, clearly heard the courthouse clock strike three. Years later, he remembered and added a trite comment on the contrast between the stillness and the pandemonium of the day that followed. Take a few deep breaths. What senses are evoked for you based on this paragraph? Don't focus on the words, just what senses you're experiencing because of these sentences. Give yourself a few seconds to think about this. Is there a memory that popped up? Perhaps a warm night in the country around a campfire? Go ahead and open your eyes and you can share in the chat what came to mind. So here I have highlighted a few phrases that evoke senses for me to get everyone thinking into the next steps of this process today. As we read on the battlefield, the night was mild and that it was to be warm the next day, we can feel it. We can transport ourselves to a summer evening. Maybe we were around a fire with friends or family. We were calm just as they were resting on the battlefield. As we read the moon a little past full, illuminated the shot-torn fields and pastures with a dim and silvery splendor, we can see in our mind what that moon looks like and how it can play silver across the field. We've all probably grown up and seen fields late at night. We know this. We probably have experienced this. And we can hear a bell chime in the distance. That is so common to many persons' daily lives, we don't even think about it anymore. These three things directly bring us into the experience of the officer of the 19th Massachusetts. And also upon reflection, we can think of a time where we felt the quiet and calm before a storm. This entire first paragraph jumping into 15 hours of one of the most violent few hours in American history begins with leading us to be emotionally in tune for everything that's to follow. That's a subtle yet an incredibly powerful tool. It sets the stage. 
These are the narrative tools I want you to keep in mind when we explore this method. So looking toward atmosphere, description, and the senses more easily transports the listener and connects us, the researcher, to our subjects with greater power. So while we're on the example of the Civil War experiences, let's explore a little further. I pulled a few images from the Civil War camp experiences from the IHS collection. I want you to look at these and think about everything you've ever learned about camp life during the Civil War. Did you come across a letter or diary entry from one of your ancestors? What did you talk about during school? Did you also read the Red Badge of Courage or another Civil War book? Have you watched a lot of documentaries, visited Civil War museums or battlefield interpretive centers? All of these things impact what we know about our ancestors and what they lived and how they experienced Civil War. And that's important to understand. It paints a picture of what we can imagine and what we can create. So if you're able to, go ahead and look at your handout, where I've defined the steps of N4D. I will talk, walk you through an example of how to apply this method to camp life during the war, and then together we'll explore other examples of how N4D can be applied. As the handout suggests, the first step is to define the moment we want to explore further. It is important to sort out what you'd like to know and try your best with the standard genealogical data you have to narrow this down to an individual moment. This helps us to better guide our sensory-driven questions with focus. So here we have created a moment for James. James T. Jeffries is in a regiment in the Western Theater of the Civil War. He and his regiment have gotten into some skirmishes, but as of yet, have not engaged in a full battle. He has seen countryside he never expected to encounter in his life. His regiment has been based in various locations for long periods of time, waiting for their next assignments. How did this impact him and his fellow soldiers? What was it like? In the case of James T. Joffreys, we don't have any surviving letters from him to account about these months stuck in camp. And let's say we don't have any from his entire regiment either, because frankly, Joffreys is fictional. So let's say what we do know is we have a muster roll and or muster in a roll call where James is in the more mountainous region of Eastern Tennessee in August of 1862. Together, we'll walk through the process of N4D, pulling together resources and details to better understand what James and his comrades could have been experiencing. So at the end, we could tell a better, more captivating story about the time that James was camped in Eastern Tennessee for longer than he would have liked. So this is the next step of the process, as you'll see from your handout. We define the moment of James T. Joffrey's in the Tennessee mountains in camp life. Maybe we've narrowed it down to a specific month, maybe a specific week, based on the records that we have in front of us. And now we are asking our sensory-based questions to guide the next step of our research. This is the poignant moment of N4D where we're asking questions about the five senses and not just jumping to what resources we can think to apply from the stuff he was beginning to see, because that doesn't give us really anything new. So here in your template, in your handout, you can work through this on your own with other stories, or you can start to think through this for maybe James T. Joffrey. But where we see is questions like, what was James seeing? What was he tasting? What was he touching? We can start to think about and ask the question, do we know how many soldiers were camped with James? From the research we know, we know that he was in a mountain, but was the camp exactly on the side of a mountain? Were they on that steep incline? Were they in a valley? Were they in a wooded area? And was there a town nearby? And of course, with tasting, there's so many different directions we can go, thinking about what rations were available, um, were they enough? Did that mean that they had to start hunting to supplement? And when it comes to touching, there's an, um, the sense of touch. There's a lot of different directions that we can go beyond some of the basics. So we can think about the weather, temperature, um, wetness or dryness. How did that play on all of his equipment? Um, how much were they carrying? What was that weight? What was the hygiene available? Do we know how long men? And the Civil War typically went before they were able to dip into a river to bathe. 
And when we think about what they're hearing, we can think about what songs were popular at that time, what songs were popular for troops to sing. Was there a, a regimental chaplain? What, what faith was he? How can we start to think about what was coming from the chaplain's voices or from, from some of his comrades? Can we think about accents um, and ethnicities and what were some of the commands that he was hearing over and over again? Or maybe were they nearby a farm? Were there animals that he could have heard bellowing in the night? And of course, with food, what food was available to cook and liquid to drink? And again, um, smelling with hygiene, and again, with vegetation in nearby farms. We know that if diaries, letters, and accounts from James do not exist, then we can turn to his regiment or other regiments who camped in similar territory during a similar time of year and weather. Because as we mentioned before, it's okay to play with the dimensions of your research and find the commonality and familiarity of one experience or event and how that would play into the story of another. We know that beyond those diaries or letters, we can check photos and ink drawings to understand how camps were organized, what items regiments carried with them. We can read regimental histories and maybe catch a note about certain songs or dishes that were common for not just in his camp, but everyone. So basically we've done the sound genealogical research and then we've expanded to um, some other social history sources that we're all comfortable with using. So exploring camp life through imagery and diaries to help evoke the senses, here are some examples of touch and why it evokes that sense for us. Pulling from the Indiana Historical Society um, collection, we grabbed a letter from Lancelot C. Eubank, 1861 to 1863, where he writes on August 28th that they, in 1862, that they built a shelter of rails and cracker boxes, which kept us dry. And then later, or earlier in 61, that it rained all day. We were under marching order, but did not go on account of the rain. And so we're able to bring in an ink drawing that shows us an example of what one of those shelters would look like. And so now we're getting pieces of some examples and descriptions, but how, does, how would that work with a master storyteller? So we go to published works for inspiration. And this um, extract from the Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane, where he lay down on a wide bunk that stretched across the end of the room. In the other end, cracker boxes were made to serve as furniture. They were grouped about the fireplace, a picture from an illustrated weekly was upon the log walls, and three rifles were paralleled on paper. Equipments hung on handy projections, and some tin dishes lay upon a small pile of firewood. A folded tent was serving as a roof, the sunlight without beating upon it made it glow like a yellow, light yellow shade. And a small window shot in a bleak square of whiter light upon the cluttered floor. So this is the next step of the process. We're going to the next step. We define the moment we want to explore. We wrote down the sensory-based questions of everything that we could think of, of what was James seeing, what was he tasting, what was he touching. And we exhausted all the traditional social history resources that we could think of to start answering some of these questions. Now we're going to think outside the box. So what resources can exist to answer these questions? We wanna keep these things in mind, that we want to break the glass on what the genealogy industry defines as resource. And we wanna be as creative as possible we want to think outside the tradition of these sources. We want to ask experts and non-experts outside of the genealogy industry that might have a different perspective and dimension of something to add to our box and leave the computer and library behind, of course, when it's safe, but we're asking you to jump in and figure out ways that you can figure out how, what James was seeing, what James was touching, and what James was tasting without going to a library. So remember, create personal experiences to understand more. And of course, the more places you look, the better, because that's what we're taught with the GPS. So things that we could do to understand more about James C. Joffrey's, we could research historic weather logs to gain a real understanding of what weather in that place was like, and then go to or ask locals 
to describe what that weather does to the region, how it works on the body. We can talk to locals to ask all sorts of questions. Is there a culture, a food historian, a botanist who really knows their stuff? What plants were available to forage? How different is Folgers chicory coffee? Flapjacks then aren't necessarily fluffy pancakes from Denny's. Find recipes and bake and cook how they would have been cooked in the camp. What were some of these handmade instruments guys were bringing with them? How does that sound differ from a professional drum or fiddle? What were all the different bugle calls? Storms in the plains sound differently than storms in the mountains. Talk to reenactors. What was it like to be wearing those clothing? The sound at night, the shadows and light plays of the mountains and valleys they fought in. Can the locals explain to you how storms roll in, how the heat settles in July? Challenge yourself to find resources that aren't on paper. Apply what life experiences you have. Looking back to the introduction on Pickett's Charge, reflect on times you were outside late in the evening the sound of church bells across the town. What does it smell like after a spring rain? The crunch of the earth? Look of dusty clouds on a back road after a drought when a few cars drive by and kick up pillows of brown that hide the trees. In the next step of the process, we are now thinking about how this applies to sharing better stories. So we've defined the event or experience that we want to explore by talking more about James T. Joffrey's and his camp life in Tennessee. We've asked the sensory-based questions about what he was seeing or what he could have been tasting or touching. We reviewed what social history stories we might know um, to add more information about James T. Joffrey's experience in camp life by looking at other letters from other um, soldiers who camped during the war. And we discovered experiential details with outside-the-box thinking like um, reaching out to local experts to ask how different things moved in Tennessee, culinary history, botany history, um, what animals would have been in that region then. We've also read fiction and nonfiction works for ideas on how to pull all that information together and how other masterful storytellers write. And then the next thing we wanna do is craft the story. We need to start writing and we need to bring in other readers and viewpoints, viewpoints to help edit. So in the introduction of The Killer Angels, author Michael Shara wrote, Stephen Crane once said that he wrote The Red Badge of Courage because reading the cold history was not enough. He wanted to know what it was like to be there, what the weather was like, what men's faces looked like. In order to live it, he had to write it. This book was written for much the same reason. So for that reason, Amy, my colleague Amy and I, when we built this, um, workshop, look to Crane and Shara and other authors of narrative nonfiction to draw more inspiration from cold facts and social history pieces to add more pieces to the story. Frustrated by the dry stories of the battle accounts found in Century Magazine, Crane remarked, I wonder what some of those fellows don't tell how they felt in those scraps. They spout enough of what they did, but they're as motionless as rocks. As we discussed earlier, storytelling matters to share the wonderful experiences and lessons of the past into the future. But to do this, great stories must be interesting and play on the interests of their family members. We aren't going to stir a bunch of intrigue and wonder talking about microfilm readers and census records. We have to be better than the cold facts. They still might not care about the process of family history or everyone in it, but they might really care about this one person, this one event, if we work at being better storytellers. There are a lot of resources out there to help craft and write a piece or oral history that will turn heads. So when my colleague and I presented N4D to the group in July, we explored this scenario together with our small group. We don't have the time to go over that today in the same way, but I want to put this on your mind. So at the dinner table, 10-year-old Sam is chatting away about the Civil War lesson they had at school. During this unit, they were studying the maps of the movement of Grant and Lee's armies. And Sam is just so amazed about all the walking. 
my legs are tired just walking around the zoo. How did they walk to completely different states? Did they have snowsuits for the winter? Weren't they tired? I couldn't do that without Gatorade and a snack. You take a sip of your drink while remembering all the Civil War draft, muster, and pension documents of your ancestor, John. You think to yourself, I could show Sam all of these, but that doesn't answer these questions. How do I learn more about John's service and what it was like to march to all those battles? Sam is so interested in the detail. How do I give Sam that about John? When we don't have anything like that for him, he was just a private. I don't think I'll be able to find much more. So when was the time that someone in your family, younger or older, showed interest in a topic that touched your family story in any way? Was someone into antique cars, military history they were learning in school, culinary history, heritage crafts, travel to a country, state, or town where your ancestors once lived? Maybe it was the civil rights or um, historic medicine. So when they brought that up, how did you respond? Were you ready with basic records or were you ready with a really great story? We can't continue to be frustrated as an industry if our response to young Sam was just, of course they were tired. Goldfish crackers and Gatorade weren't around yet. It would have been hard. Or, you know, your great whatever granddad served in that war. Then what? Sam is already hooked. He or she is begging for a good story in return. We have dropped the ball on getting young people to be excited, enthralled, and begging for more about their family stories. It has nothing to do with what their ancestors did or didn't do, but everything to do with how we tell it. So let's look at another example. A, research, a recent research request came to the desk of my colleague, Nicole martinez Legrand who is our coordinator of multicultural collecting initiatives. This request was from a woman inquiring about the life of her grandfather, Miguel Aguerto, in Gary, Indiana. We know that Miguel was born in 1891 in Peru and died in Gary Lake County, Indiana. That's Peru, the country, not the city. Curious about how Miguel came to Gary from Peru, Nicole did some digging in addition to trying to find out more about his life in Indiana. A 1919 employment card shows him as a laborer on the Panama Canal working for 17 cents an hour, which today is $2.55 an hour. Not really minimum wage, right? His employment span from working on the railroad to the docks. We know that U.S. Steel Corporation and its subsidiary Universal Atlas Cement Company provided both the steel and cement needed to build and maintain this vital canal connecting the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, which revolutionized trade and logistics. At the same time that Miguel was working with these companies in Panama, Latinos were recruited to, in the thousands to work in the steel mills of Chicago and Northwest Indiana in the 1910s, along with African Americans moving into Northern industrial cities as cheap labor, labor and strike bearers for United States Steel during the Great Strike of 1919. In the following decades, the Latino population survived institutional prejudices, the crippling Great Depression, and forged new communities. For Miguel's granddaughter, the genealogical records are slim, but we do find record of his employment and a note in a city directory that Miguel finds his way to Gary by the end of the 1920s. This independent single Latino man working for the steel industry most likely lived in boarding homes upon arrival to Gary. The Latino communities and immigrants grew beside the African American workers who settled here, and the distinction and discrimination between these communities and other communities who worked on the mill can be obvious when looking at the housing and location of housing these workers were allowed to live in. The mills followed the paternal industrial city planning that sometimes worked in other locations, but almost always lost the agency and authority of an individual to live fully and freely in a space. The company divided these lands into sections where one was for um, American born foremen, another for European skilled workers, and very little space for the unskilled immigrants who formed the majority of the mills workforce. These early recruits of individual males were often in company boarding houses. 
they found themselves under employer supervision during non-working hours and charged more for shelter and food than other private boarding homes. They faced constant harassment by Gary police. Moving to the patch or slums of the south side of Gary gave them more freedom than the company boarding houses. But even in the patch, these homes were restricted to essentially shacks, stacked on one another. There was no municipality in these areas and rampant overcrowding led to jumps in crime and health problems like pneumonia and tuberculosis. In 1924, the Mexican consul visited Gary and the, said the conditions were indescribably wretched and they were shocked by the congestion of humanity. In December of 1930, Gary's International Institute, an immigrant-oriented welfare agency sponsored by the YWCA, reported that Mexicans are the least rooted in the community and consequently less equipped to meet this period of depression through which we are passing. The agony and suffering that all of these people endure is beyond comprehension of any who have not experienced it. So just as we work through this process on the Civil War camp life experience of James T. Joffrey's, let's talk through what was likely happening around Miguel. And so, for Miguel's granddaughter, when she reached out to us, she might want to know about the work and living conditions for Miguel during the first few years in Gary because we can't find much else on him. So we want to give her some essence of what uh, Miguel Aguerto experiences were like. And so what was Miguel seeing? We want to ask questions like how tight was his living quarters? What did the neighborhood he lived in look like? And then jump more into how were the sick or injured care for. Then we're going into what food was served in these boarding homes. Were, was the food that Miguel was used to, was it easily accessible? Were they cooking it? Did he have to find other ways to access the food? We need to think, we start to ask about what kind of furniture or fabric was available for guys in these boarding homes and how likely they might have been cleaned and how often. Was he hearing familiar accents, familiar languages, or was in, in these patch areas and boarding homes, was he surrounded by Eastern European immigrants, African Americans from the South and Southern accents? Did he understand the language of his supervisor? When did he become fluent in English? Could he communicate with all the workers and the people living around him? How challenging was that? We all know when we don't understand what someone's saying for whatever reason, how frustrating that can be and how isolating that can feel. In these crowded spaces next to the mills, you can imagine what smells would be like. Did they have other communities? Did they have diverse dinners on their plates? What all was he experiencing around them? So while my colleague, Nicole, has searched everywhere in our collection and extensively on ancestry and family search, we certainly have a lot of places left to look for Miguel's name. Traveling north, we can explore the collections of U.S. Steel, but we know that these portrayals would likely be embellished to favor the company, not entirely true of conditions, as well as racially biased. We can search any collections left of the cultural aid organizations meant to support recent, recent immigrants, and we can scour the newspaper for any hints of Miguel, but likely no, he and his peers and their voices will likely not be represented here. We could explore the possibility of Latino community newspapers and churches for a record of Miguel too. But even if we don't find specifically Miguel, we still have a lot left to explore. There were many independent Latino and other immigrant steel workers that, could study, that we could study to look at their experience. In addition to the academic writings on the poor working conditions of Gary at this time, we can study what famous social reformist Jane Addams had to say about these conditions. We can review resources, interviews, and oral histories of not just the community in Gary, but other industrial, cramped communities surrounding steel mills, mining towns, and fishing ports and textile mills. And we can go to these places. We can inquire about the living memory of the people still there, of the steel workers of today. We should be in the landscape of this unique story and imagine ourselves in this place 100 years ago. So about two months ago, I traveled to the Dunes National Lakeshore at Lake Michigan for a break from Indianapolis. While sitting on the beach, my friend and I sat there looking at the remnants of this industry around us. We asked ourselves how different this space was 100 years ago. 
Down the sand, I saw the smokestacks and mills of Gary. Today, they are silent, quiet, with only hints of smoke. To the horizon, I saw the towering skyscrapers of Chicago, the end product of the resources exactly under me and the people before me. How much has this place changed? Has it suffered? Not just the dunes, but the pollution, noise, and people of a city that stands as an example of why one industry towns hurt the population and can deplete regions. Thinking about Miguel, I wondered more what that was like. And with the vein of turning to the arts to better paint a physical and metaphorical image of this moment 100 years ago, I found the writings of Carl Sandburg and the stories in his Smoke and Steel poetry. This one titled Five Towns on the B and O. By day, tireless smokestacks, hungry, smoky shanties hanging to the slope, pruning. We get by, that's all. By night, all lit up, fire gold bars, fire gold flues, and the shanty shanking, shaking in clumsy shadows, almost the hills shaking, all crooning. By God, we're going to find out or know why. And later in his po poem titled The Mayor of Gary, 1915, I asked the mayor of Gary about the 12-hour workday and the seven-day week. And the mayor of Gary answered more workmen steal time on the job in Gary than any other place in the United States. Go into the plants and you will see men sitting around doing nothing. Machinery does everything, said the mayor of Gary when I asked him about the 12 hour day and the seven day week. And he wore cool cream pants, the mayor of Gary and white shoes and a barber had fixed him with a shampoo and a shave and he was easy and imp imperturbable. Said 96 and children were soaking their heads at bubbling fountains on the street corners. And I said goodbye to the mayor of Gary and I went out from the city hall and turned the corner into Broadway. And I saw workmen wearing le leather shoes, scruffed with fire and fenders and pitted with little holes from running molten steel. And some had bunches of specialized muscles around their shoulder blades, hard as pig iron. Muscles of their forearms were sheet steel, and they looked to me like men who had been somewhere. Here's a crop view of a set of sociological, um, sociologically important maps of immigrant poverty produced by the residents of Whole House, the Chicago settlement house established in 1889 by Jane Adams that details the nationalities of Whole House's neighbors in the near west side of Chicago. Hull House, open to serve recently arrived Im European immigrants to provide social and educational opportunities for working class people, many of whom were recent European immigrants. This amazing resource reminds us of the incredible and vivid stories of every person who came in close contact with our ancestors and their experience, how, how it impacts our own. Can you imagine how much more information we would have if Sanborn maps looked like this, or if we created layer maps of city directories, Sanborns, nationality studies, census records with contemporary maps? How would all of this information better inform the experiences of our ancestors and what we live through today? Until someone jumpstarts this tech, can we expand our research to think of communities as a whole? So whether your ancestor was an Italian immigrant who lived here on Ewing Street, or a Chinese immigrant a few blocks over, their stories touch each other and inform each other. Their food, their music, their customs, their concerns, they impacted the daily space of our ancestors and as micro historians of our personal stories, we should be looking to the way these people and their stories, their communities, their struggles, impact our experiences today and our views of the past and present. So whether your ancestor fought in the Civil War, or worked in the mills beside Miguel, or you're trying to find out more about the village your Jewish ancestors were forced to leave behind in the 1930s, or a female ancestor you've only seen a hash mark for and a name in a Bible or old obituary, I hope that you start looking differently, that you start to play with the dimensions of your research, that you start asking sensory-based questions in moments we desire to know more, that you think about that fourth dimension, 
and adding in the senses to your research and storytelling. And that hopefully when we explore this together, we start to bring empathy and understanding back into our stories so that we can truly look to the past and inform the future. So as you leave here today, I hope you keep thinking about and take that handout with you. What research are you working on that you can use this method or maybe helping someone else who maybe you found a story that's a great way and a great jumping board to really get it to be um, engaging and inspiring. And so you can sit down and start to write. Thank you very much.